was painted whole All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Sin had left a crimson stain See, my clothes were hand-me-downs, my shoes were full of holes, and I had to walk four miles to school every day through the sleet and the rain and the cold. Well, I've seen the night that my daddy would cry for the things that his family would need, but all he ever got was a bad land farm and seven hungry mouths to feed. And you know our home fires never flickered once Cause when all of those things went wrong Mom would reach up and take the hymn book down And sing us all a song many a night to the tune of what a friend but come morning rock of ages would wake me gently once again then dad would reach up and take his bible down and start reading he read it loud and he read it long and i always felt our home was blessed when dad would say mama sing us a song sis left home first i guess then Tommy, then Johnny, and then Dan. And I had to become my mama's little man. And it seemed as my daddy's back grew weak, my f daddy's faith just grew strong. Those were the greatest days of all when my mama sang us a song. See, there's no voice left to fill those halls, and there's no steps to grace the floor. Cause you see, my mama sings in heaven now, around God's golden throne. And I'll always believe my world is a better place. Cause you see, one time, my mama sang us a song.
Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, there in the Old Testament. We're going back to take a look at 1 Samuel this morning, and I trust you can find 1 Samuel there in the, pretty much in the beginning of your Bibles of the Old Testament. You'll find the book of 1 Samuel, and we praise God for this. 1 Samuel starts off with a story about Hannah. Hannah is a young Jewish maiden girl that's married, and, and of all Jewish girls, you know, their dreams and their hopes was to have children. For a little Jewish girl, that was her hope. That's what she grew up with. That's what she had planned for all of her life, was to have children and to have a family. And Hannah's no different than all the other little Jewish girls and young maidens that were married. And unfortunately, Hannah could not have children. Because the Bible says that God had shut up her womb. So that's a pretty tough situation, isn't it? God had shut up her womb. Like many mothers today, I think for, for mothers, this will be for all of us, of course, but I think mothers are more concerned and think more and worry more about our families and our children and our grandchildren and where we're going and what's happening. They're the ones that are always attending our cuts and our scrapes when we come home and, and taking care of us. They're the ones that are always there as we get a little older and we begin to come into dating as teenagers and we go through those young puppy loves and heartaches and breakups and going steady and not steady. And, and it always seems to be mama that's the one that's talking with us and counseling with us and dad, ah, he don't care, he don't worry about it. Everything's fine. We find mamas the ones that stay up late at night and wait for the door to open to hear the car door and make sure that their children are home, even when they're in their adult age and haven't married yet. We find them still sitting up, waiting. Dad's already in bed sleeping and snoring. No problem, everything's fine, go to bed. No, nope, no, nope. I got to stay up because I've got to worry about my little girl or my little boy. And you know, and parents have hopes for their children and Hopes for their grandchildren, and you perhaps today here have many hopes. Perhaps some of your hopes and dreams are maybe not turning out like you hoped. Maybe not planning like you hoped, or especially for your family. And you have loved ones that you've been hoping and praying for that would be saved and come to know the Lord. And, and that hope seems to be fading as time begins to go further and further and deeper. And as they get older uh, in life, we uh, sometimes begin to lose hope that it's just not going to happen. And we begin to lose hope uh, of those. And, and sometimes we get to a place where we think that all hope is gone and all hope is lost. What will I do? And Hannah was certainly in no different situation here, being a young gal and married. And, of course, she was married to Elkanah and uh, her husband, and he already had another wife. Uh, uh, Peniah was his first wife that he had, and Peniah had given him sons and daughters, and Hannah had not. So you can imagine the conflict in that home back then in those days and what was going on and how heartbroken she was and trying to give you a little bit of a story here behind to see where we're at and you can just see all of her dreams and hopes gone and crushed. No children, barren. And the fact that God had closed up her womb. All my dreams, all my hopes, gone, crushed. And then to have someone constantly reminding you about it. And other things. And we're going to look at that this morning because we all have hope. I hope most of all that everybody here this morning has the blessed hope of heaven. I hope you have the blessed hope of the Lord Jesus Christ today. I trust that you have that blessed hope of salvation that God gives to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. If above all things, if you have no other hope, don't leave here today without that hope. The hope of heaven and knowing for sure that you're going beyond a shadow of a doubt. Those of you that are watching by television, we'd say the same to you today as well. And Thank you for welcoming to our television program and internet today and radio. God bless you. Stay with us. I believe God's got something wonderful in store for us today. And most of all, if you've never trusted Christ, we're going to invite you to do so in just a few moments from now to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to have that blessed hope of an assurance of salvation and the blessed hope of heaven. I'd like to share just three simple little truths with you if we can this morning, and hopefully we can do this briefly and quickly for you. I believe in this story we see here in Hannah. That is uh, simply entitled, There Are Hope Stealers, There Are Hope Promoters, and There's Hope's Reward. Let's take a look, first of all, at those that would steal 
rob you of your hope. We find, I think, in here in this passage of Scripture, far off with me, begin reading in verse 4. And when the time was that Elkanah, that's the man, the, the husband, offered, he gave to Paniah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. Verse 5. But unto Hannah, his second wife, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but. Don't you just love that conjunction sometimes there? The Lord had shut up her womb. Boy, she's facing some real circumstances, isn't she? And her adversary, don't you love an adversary? Also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did, that's uh, uh, Elkanah, uh, so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she, that's Paniah, provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, uh, to her, Hannah, Why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved, and am I not better to thee than ten sons? And so let's take a look at some things that would rob you this morning of your hope in this passage. You got hope today? Somebody stealing your hope? Someone robbing your hope this morning? Well, I hope not, but there are some things, and we need to be aware of the enemy that's out there. And the first one is that of criticism from others. You know, one of the first things that can, that can cause you to lose hope this morning and to, and to uh, be down in your hope and to, to rob you is the criticizers. Don't you love it when people come along and criticize you? Don't you love it, especially when your heart's grieving and you're going through times of difficulties and, and sorrow and, and, and your hopes are being shattered, your dreams, your plans are being shattered, and you got somebody standing on the sidelines criticizing. Oh, I tell you, I love the criticizers. Oh, we see it here in verses 6 and 7. Notice, in her adversary, that's, uh, by the way, that's Paniah, the first wife there, uh, was what, first of all, she was provoking her sore to make her fret. Now, the word provoke there means to, call, to vex, grieve, uh, to irritate, uh, to, to sting up the heat, and, and to heat it up. And so here she was. Boy, she was stirring up the pot. I can imagine the, the jealousy and the competition and so forth going on. That's why we're not supposed to have two wives, guys, just one. Amen? Amen. One's enough. Amen. Amen. That's all we need. But anyway, she was just provoking her. She was stirring up the pot. She was causing her heart to grieve. No telling what Paniah was saying and probably laughing and joking and criticizing. Uh, you know, hey, I can give my husband children. I've given him sons already. I've given him daughters. And you haven't done squat. You know, by the way, because after all, you know, look at me and I may be better than you and there's something wrong with you. But you got to remember back in Jewish days during these times when things like this happened, it was always they like to relate it to sin in their life. Boy, there must be some gross, grievous, deep sin in your life that God has shut up your womb. Some type of punishment or judgment. But if you read the story, that wasn't at all. This was simply to, to fulfill the purpose and the will of God that was about to do something fantastic. But nevertheless, the criticizers out there will rob you of your hope. Oh, will they will. Notice the word sore there means, that means sorrow, a grief, to cause hurt feelings. And then to fret means to tremble. So Paniah was doing a good job. And that was her adversary. And I'm telling you this morning, don't let the criticizers rob you of your hope. Because they will. Especially even if you have the hope of any kind of hope of wanting to be saved today and come to Christ. And you've been thinking about it and maybe meditating on it. And perhaps you've shared it with some of your family or loved ones. And then immediately they start on you. Boy, you don't need that. What do you need Jesus for a crutch? What do you need him? And, all, and then on and on and on. And you don't need to get, and they just, they criticize you for even wanting to come to Christ. So be careful. The criticizers will rob you. Secondly, I see circumstances can rob you of your hope. Look at her circumstance. Her womb was barren. God had closed up her womb. You can't get any more difficult circumstance than that when you're a mother wanting to have children. Amen? And I don't know what circumstance you're facing today. 
I don't know what circumstances you're going through, but perhaps it's the circumstances that have you surrounded that looks like all hope is gone. There's no way out. We're not going to get out of this. This isn't going to work out. This isn't going to, we're not going to have a good outcome of this because of the circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. Don't let the circumstances rob you of your hope. As long as God is still on the throne, there is hope. Matter of fact, for those of you that are not saved and have never trusted the Lord, as long as the Lord delays His coming from glory, there is still hope for you to get saved. Don't give up. Don't lose your hope because of the circumstances that you're in and facing. God can work it out and turn it around for you if you just let Him. And so circumstances can rob you of your hope. There's another one. Look at verse 14 with me. Verse 14. Everybody turn to verse 14. My Bible, it's the next page over, but let's take a look at it. And Eli, now this is the high priest. They've gone up to worship like they've done year after year. And uh, uh, Hannah's in the temple praying unto the Lord, uh, and she's praying from her heart. Her mouth is moving, but there's nothing coming out. Have you ever been that way where you've been someplace and you've been praying or talking, and your, your, mouth's, your mouth's going, but nothing's coming out? And somebody come up to you and, and begin all, all of them immediately start telling you what you're saying or what you're not saying or what you've done or haven't done. I mean, don't you love it? Hey, no different right here. Now, Eli's the high priest, but you've got to understand, right now he's kind of okay, but when you continue to start reading the story, he gets mixed up with his two wicked sons, and, and, you know, he's got problems to start with himself. But look what he says here. And Eli said unto her, verse 14 of chapter 1 here, 1 Samuel, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Don't you love it? Now, you may not agree, think on this, but this is, this is the one I go for that I uh, simply call. Here's another thing that will rob you of your hope. Because, you know, this woman's here praying for the Lord to fulfill her hope. And, and about this time, here comes of all people, the, the, the high priest, uh, uh, Eli, uh, there in the temple. And he said, woman, you're drunk. Put up the wine from, from, you, from you. Now, he had no word she said. All he saw was her lips moving. You can read the story there. But I like to call this bad counsel. Let me tell you something this morning. Bad counsel will rob you of your hope. You don't need that kind of counsel when you're pouring out your heart to the Lord about something. Bad counsel will rob you of your hope this morning. You need to be careful when you seek counsel. I gave some scriptures here on that concerning that. Now, you want to read about counsel and wisdom and a multitude of wisdom and counsel, read Proverbs. I mean, Solomon talks a lot about it, all right? But Proverbs eleven fourteen, where no counsel is, what happens? The people fall. But in a multitude of counselors, there is what? Safety. Now, I'm finding today people don't want to listen to counsel. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. You got any purposes this morning that are being disappointed? Could be because you're getting bad counsel. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Look at Proverbs 19, 20. Hear counsel. Receive instruction. Now, why should you do that? that thou mayest be wise when? In thy latter years. In other words, as you get older, in your latter years. Counsel is important. And I find so many today receive bad counsel. I find so many today go and get bad counsel because they listen to everybody that can't give them good counsel. See, he said there's a multitude of wisdom and safety and establishment in, in, in counsel. But in that multitude of counsel, you need to get good, godly, biblical counsel. That means I don't care if it's family or anybody else. You need to find men and women that have spent some time in this book, that know this book, that walk the walk, talk the talk, uh, live the life, and seek their counsel, godly counsel, that will help you. Because if not, you're going to get bad counsel. And that can rob you of your hope. Sometimes I get to where I just don't want to counsel anybody or anything. Because they never listen to you anyway. They never, do, they never follow what you tell them. 
I find most of the time all they do is want to come and they want to tell you what they're going to do. And, then, and, and what they want is your approval. They're really not really seeking your counsel and asking for advice and counsel from a biblical, godly, biblical standpoint. They just simply want to come and tell you, well, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I've made my plans. And you can tell their minds have already made up what they're going to do. And what they're looking for is, I guess, for the preacher's approval, for the pastor's blessing, and so forth. And nothing drives you more nuts than to spend hours and hours with people in counseling and then they not do a thing. You've gone over with them. Not one thing. As a matter of fact, just do the opposite. There were times in Alaska that uh, I had the wonderful privilege of having the council marriage partners that were seeking, uh, going, uh, getting ready to go through divorce. And I did not like that. But that's what I was asked to do. And oh, I tell you, sometimes I would spend six months, nine months of counseling, pouring my heart out with them and, and agonizing with them. And it would tell Carol, I said, man, I feel like I'm going through it. And then it's all said and done, boom. They go do their own thing, get to go, go here, get their divorce. And I go, nine months just went out the window. Then start all over again with another one. We know we went through it up there with them. Oh, no, you better seek godly counsel, biblical counsel. And, every, and by the way, I say something? Don't make a major decision when you're upset. Don't make any major decision when you're in great sorrow or grief. Now, I'm going to give you some good counseling here this morning. This is what they tell you in counseling and psychology and sociology and all that kind of stuff. Don't ever make a major decision when you're upset, when you're going through difficult times, when, when you're going through a great deal of sorrow and grief and, and all these kinds of things. Do not make a major decision. When I talk about major decisions, I'm talking about moves, careers, uh, jobs, relocations, churches, I mean, uh, you know, marriage. Uh, these, these are major decisions in your life. Don't make a major decision when you're going through those times. And by all means, get good godly counsel. Because if not, bad counsel is going to rob you of your hope. Look at verse 10 with me. There's a fourth one here. Verse 10. Now, these are the hope stealers. That is criticism, circumcision, uh, circumstances, bad counsel, and a fourth one here is found in verse 10. This is with Hannah. And she was, notice this, in bitterness. That word bitterness there means that the thought of death. She had come to the place of even the thought of death because of the circumstances, because of the criticism, because of the bad counsel from the high priest, no less. And she was to the point where she was bitter in her heart and in her soul to the point of death. Listen to what it says. She was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And I call this self-doubt. She would got to a place where there was self-doubt in her life. This isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. My womb's not going to be open. I'm not going to have a child. God's not hearing. God's not answering. And she was to the point of bitterness in her soul, to the point of death. Now, I want to tell you, those things will rob you of your hope. Just because God doesn't move an answer tomorrow or the same day, don't give up. Don't get self-doubt, because when it becomes self-doubt, then there's a lack of faith in your life. Now, those are the hope stealers. They'll steal your hope. What are they? There are four of them. What can rob you today or steal your hope from you today? What's the first thing? Criticism. What's the second one? Circumstances. What's the third one? Bad counsel. What's the fourth one? Self-doubt. They will rob you of your hope. Moms, Especially for your kids. Boy, I don't know about my kids. I don't know if they're going to turn out right. Or everything's going to, and on and on. And, and their, their homes and their marriages, you're concerned about them. And even when they get older, their education and all that they're going through, mamas never stop worrying. Mamas never stop caring. Mamas never stop hoping till the day they go to the grave. And so if, if that's happening to you, Oh, dear sweet, dear ladies, and all you young girls that have hopes and dreams, and, and you single ladies that have hopes and dreams, don't let the criticizers out there, don't let the circumstances, don't let some bad ungodly counsel and self-doubt rob you of your hope. You hang in there. Now let's look at some promoters. See, I'm going to give you four promoters now. Very quickly, four things that will promote your hope. 
How many of you want your hope promoted this morning? All right, a couple of you do. All right, how many of you want your hope promoted this morning? Amen. All right, here we go. Here's the first one. Number one, prayer. Number one, prayer. Prayer will promote your hope. All right, follow along with me in the scriptures here. Let's go back to verse 10 and 12. All right, and then we're going to look at the several other verses here. Everybody in verse 10? Circle the word. Notice in verse 10. And she what? Prayed. You see verse 10? There's the word. She prayed. And she prayed unto the Lord. Amen? Look at verse uh, 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 10 again. And she says unto the Lord. She's talking to the Lord. She's praying unto the Lord. Verse 12. And then it came to pass that she would what? Continued praying. She continued praying praying. Prayer. Look at verse 15 with me. And Hannah answered and said, Oh, no, my Lord, I am a woman in, uh, there, and I have not drunk neither wine nor sorrow, uh, but I have poured out my soul unto the Lord. Hannah was praying. Look at verse 17. Then Eli said, and she said, No, thou hast asked of him. She was praying unto the Lord. Verse 26 and verse 27 tell us that Hannah was praying unto the Lord. Now, Mom, today, especially you ladies, in every situation, prayer, prayer will promote your hope. But you got to get into praying. Listen to what Matthew 7, 7 and 8 says. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Now, there are three present imperatives there. Ask, knock, and seek. Three present imperatives. That's in the present tense. Those are three commands when it comes to praying. Now look at the next verse, and it goes from an imperative command to a present participle, which means a continual, repeated action. Notice it changes from ask now to for everyone that what? Asketh. You notice you got two dots there after you in verse 7, and then the four is a continuation. It carries over. So the verse doesn't end there. Asketh. There's a present participle. What's the results if you keep asking? Oh, one of you. What's the results? And he that seeketh, findeth. And he that knocketh, it shall be opened. You see. All right, are you with me? Prayer will promote your hope. And that's what we see Hannah doing here is she's praying, praying, praying. Don't give up praying. Second one that will promote your hope. Faith. Faith will promote your hope today. Faith will promote your hope. Notice in verse 7, year after year after year, this was going on. But Hannah was still hanging in there. She wasn't giving up. Year after year, her faith, the Bible says what? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. Faith will promote your hope. But the only way you're going to get your faith promoted, you got to hear the word. See, you got to hear the word. The word is what promotes your faith, you see. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. You see, this, there was one, there's a passage in here where they asked the Lord, help thou my unbelief. They were struggling with their faith. In another passage it says, Lord, increase our faith. You know how you get your faith, uh, your, your unbelief helped and, and move a little bit on to the next phase? You know how you get your faith increased? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. If you're not here to hear the word, your faith's not going to grow. But faith will promote your hope. Look at your study notes there and read with me there in Romans. Beautiful passage here. I may pause, and you know what we pause for around here. Therefore, for this reason, this cause, or because of, being what? What does that mean, justified? Another, another good safe word for it. Saved. You've been saved how? By what? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. By whom also we have access. How do you have access to God? By faith, by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And what? We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. In other words, for patience is endurance or perseverance. And patience, experience, and experience what? Hope. And verse 5, and what? Hope. Make it not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. I'm telling you this morning, faith will promote your hope. There are four that will rob it and steal it, but there are four that will promote it, if you let it. Let's look at the third one. It was mentioned in this verse. I think a third one there in verse 7, we find it. Notice in verse 7, it says, what did she do? She went up, what? Year after year after year. 
Now, this has got to be quite some time because Paniah had already given him sons and daughters. So we got some time going by here, don't we? You know what that tells me? You want me to tell you something that will promote your hope today? Perseverance. We quit too soon. We quit too often. We give up. But perseverance. Hang in there. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't lose hope. You persevere. If you persevere, you're going to see something. But we quit and give up so early. You say, well, I've been praying for my loved ones to be saved for 20 years. Then pray 20 more years. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on the situation, the circumstance that God's put in your life. You keep praying for them. Don't give up on that marriage. You keep praying. You keep asking God. You keep believing. Don't give up on your children. You keep praying for mom and dad. Don't give up on them. You persevere until the end. And it's not over yet till you quit breathing. And when we put you in the box and plant you in the ground and put six feet of dirt over you, then it's ended. But until then, don't give up. Hang in there. Pray. Let faith arise in your soul. And let faith arise in your heart, you see. And let it motivate and stir you. Then persevere through it. Hang in there. Mom, don't give up on those kids. Don't give up on those grandkids. Don't give up on those great grandkids. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your marriage, dear wife, that's out there today and, and your marriage seems to be a bust and it's splitting apart and it's, it's a mess and it's chaos and you sit there and you say, I've heard so many times say, oh, but preacher, there's no hope for my marriage. Listen to me. Yes, there is. There is hope in Christ and Christ can put any marriage back together if you let him. There is hope. Don't give up. Don't give up. Oh, we quit too soon and we give up too soon. Persevere, child of God. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because of your faith. Notice, what is he praising God for? Their faith is what? Growing exceedingly. How does your faith grow? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word. And Paul's praising God. And the charity, that's the love of every one of you all toward each other, aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in the churches of God for your patience and faith in your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Don't give up. Paul said it this way in Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always. With all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all, talk to me, church, with all what? Perseverance. You need to have a little perseverance. Don't give up. To say this and to say that is to doubt God. Folks, we serve a big God and a great God, and God can work anything out. You know that all it takes is our pastor in Alaska used to tell us, he'd get up all the time, he'd say, he'd look out there to the audience, 3,000 of them sitting down, and he'd say, you know what, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, he said, all, he said, all it takes for a marriage to work is for two mature people. Just two mature people can make it work and make it go. And I say this to them in kindness when I have to do that and look at them and they both assure me that they're saved and they've been saved and so forth and so on. And I said, do you believe this book? And, you know, we go through all of that and I just look at them and say, then why not start acting like it? Start living like it. Start acting like it. And God can put it all back together. And there's hope for it. And it would bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. It would give Him praise. And you say, well, preacher, what if all that's already happened? Come and line up and we'll talk about it later. There's still hope for you. Don't ever give up hope. There's still hope. God can still use it and put it back together. God can still make it happen for you. Don't give up. You say, well, it's already happened. That's all right. That's all right, okay? Let's pick it up where we are right now and let's go forward. Past is the past. What's happened has happened is done. We can't change that. But we can go forward. And we can move forward to the glory of God and bring Him glory through it all. Amen. Don't give up. Persevere. Mom, today, hang in there for your kids and your grandkids and your kids' marriage and your own marriage, whatever it is. Hang. Don't give up. 
persevere to the end. And then sometimes maybe another promoter I see here is found in verse 11 and verse 28. Look at verse 11 with me. Everybody in verse 11? Verse number 11 says this. And she vowed a vow. Oh, okay, what's a vow? A vow is to promise. It is the act of verbally consecrating something to God. That's what a vow is. In other words, vowing to perform something. She's going to make a vow here. She's going to promise to perform something. She says, and she made a vow unto the Lord of hosts, and she says this, If thou will indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a male child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. There shall no razor come upon his head. Look at verse 28. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. That is Samuel. She had the spirit of sacrifice. Hannah came to a place in her life where she had a spirit of sacrifice. I believe if you study the life of Hannah, Hannah had already dedicated and given herself to the Lord. And now she's give, wanting to give Samuel. God, if you will give me this little boy, if you will give me a man child, God, I vow, I make a solemn promise and an oath to you, I will give him back to you all the days of his life. If you will just give me a man child. And this went on year after year after year, but she persevered. Her faith increased. Her faith grew. She didn't listen to all the criticizers and the circumstances that her womb was shut up. That didn't bother her. She knew that she served a God that could open up her womb with no problem. Oh, did she ever. And all oh, the spirit of sacrifice and I believe first of all God wants us first. First and foremost the Lord wants us. Romans 12 1 says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God wants a sacrifice, and the first one he wants is you. God wants you and me first. Over in here, Paul says, and when he came to the church of Corinth, and when he came to giving, Paul says, and they gave of themselves first. God wants you and I to give of ourselves. The writer of Hebrews put it this way. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, uh, giving thanks unto his name. You know what she was doing? Year after year, Hannah was offering up the praise of sacrifice unto the Lord. Continually from her lips. Oh, I'm telling you, we serve a great God. There is the spirit of sacrifice. Now, so now we've learned there are four things that can steal and rob our hope. What are they? Criticism, circumstances, bad counsel, fourth one, self-doubt. What are the four things that can promote your hope today? Prayer, faith, perseverance, and the spirit of sacrifice. If you'll put those things to work in your life, and you will begin to apply those into your life today, just as Hannah, let's take a look very quickly at the rewards of hope. Are you ready for the rewards of hope? Look at verse number 20, first of all, right off the bat. Verse number 20 of chapter 1. Everybody there? What's it say? Wherefore, it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, talk, talk to me, had what? Had conceived that she bare, and what did she bear? A son, and called his name Samuel. Because I have asked of him of the Lord. Look down in verse 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition that I've asked of him. When? Year after year after year. She didn't give up. She didn't let the hope stealers rob her of her hope. She let promotions promote her hope, and God gave her. And guess what? She got exactly what she asked for. Amen? You see that? Here's the rewards of hope. She got exactly what she asked for and even 
better. I want to show you something else that happened. Look with me in chapter 2. Chapter 2. Here's another reward of hope rewards. Everybody in chapter 2? All right, verse number 1. Follow along with me in chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. I want to tell you the second thing that will promote your hope. That tells me that Hannah's faith was increased. Her faith was increased. Here's another reward of hope. It will increase your faith. Oh, praise God. Look at another one. Turn over to chapter 3 with me. What did Hannah pray for? Talk to me. Well, what kind of child? Man child. Is that what she got? And what was she doing in chapter 2? Boy, she's talking about the horn. She's talking about exceeding this, her mouth. Pray. I mean, her faith was increased. I want to tell you something. But look at here. Let's look at a third thing that promoted her hope. Everybody in chapter 3, verse 10. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. And what were those words? Oh, look over to verse 20. And all of Israel, from Dan even to Bathsheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet to the Lord. Oh, she didn't get just a child. She didn't just get a man child. She got a prophet. Hallelujah. you got to remember this is the time period of the transition between judges and kings. Israel no longer wanted judges to rule and reign over them. They wanted a king like all the rest of the heathen countries around them. So God raised up Samuel. And Samuel the prophet would now, matter of fact, Samuel was the one who formed what we call the, the company of prophets. Okay. And, there, and Samuel, and so God raised up Samuel, and guess what? It goes on. Oh, she got more than just a man child. She got more than just her answer to prayer. She got more than just a prophet. Look at this. Now, and then D there in your outline. Guess what? When she got only, got only the prophet uh, Samuel, guess what Samuel would do? During this transition time, Samuel, according to over in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verses 9, chapter 9 and 10, Samuel would anoint the first king of Israel, who happened to be Saul. And then over in chapter 16, Samuel would happen to anoint the second king of Israel, who happened to be, tell me, David. And oh, what came from David? David, who was the one that would carry the lineage of the Messiah, the Christ. I'm telling you, Hannah got more than she ever asked for. She not only got a baby boy, she not only got a prophet, she got a prophet that would anoint the king that would literally be in the lineage and the line of the Messiah that would come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you give up. The blessing is just around the corner. If you hang in there, I'll tell you the rewards. Friend, today, if you're here without Christ and you've never been saved, you can have that blessed hope of salvation by knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can come to Christ. And if you don't have that blessed hope of knowing that heaven would be your home, if you died today, are you 100% sure? Friends, you can be today. You can have that blessed hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not telling you everything's going to just work out punky dory and roses and peaches and creams. Oh, by far that. But the first thing you need to do, you need to have the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be saved and born again and start that blessed hope. Don't you give up. If you're saved today, don't you give up. You persevere. You don't let these things rob you or steal you. Let it arise in your heart and don't give up. And boy, I tell you what, the rewards will be worth it all. You got family members need to be saved. I'd get out on this altar this morning, get out here, begin to pray for them. God, I've been giving up. God, I've been slacking up. Lord, I've been giving up my hope on my family members that are lost. It looks like impossible. It's not going to happen. Oh, no. You get out here and pray even the harder. You get down here and pray and have God to rise your face and strengthen your faith and ask God to give you the perseverance to, to hang in there with it. And if necessary, a spirit of sacrifice that God would save your family members and your loved ones that need to be saved in marriages. But if you're here today without the Lord Jesus Christ, we offer to you that blessed hope of salvation, that blessed hope of heaven, eternal life, everlasting life, if you're willing to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and born again. Held heads bowed and eyes closed. No one looking at this time. Give me just a moment to speak to our television audience out there. 
radio and internet and those and YouTube and so forth. Dear friend, if you've given up all hope and you've lost hope, oh, why not get it back today if you're saved? Take this message and apply it to your life. Put it to practice. Go home and read this passage again over and over and listen to what God says and what God will do. But friend, if you're watching and listening by whatever means, you've never been saved, born again. You've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Why not do so today? Why not do so right now? The Bible says, Behold, the day is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. The Bible says, Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. Oh, my friend, if you hear His voice today, why not come to Christ? We're going to help you do that right now. We're going to help you pray a prayer. It's the prayer is words that come from your lips and your mouth. But pray it from your heart. And believe God in it when you pray it. And we come to know Christ. The Bible says we must believe, we must confess, we must call, we must receive. So that's what we're going to do right now. Would you bow with us and pray? Those of you here in the auditorium, bow and pray with us as well. If you've never trusted Christ, simply pray this. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord. I confess, God, that I've sinned against you in heaven. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me, to wash me in your blood. He will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place and he paid my sin debt just for me. I believe he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus. For the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I receive you into my heart. The Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Friend, receive him today as your Lord and Savior. Call upon him. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer just now with us to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, God bless you. Thank you for making that decision for Christ. It'll be the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. And heaven now will be your home. Praise the Lord. Until we meet again or see again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you. If we don't see you this side of heaven, we'll see you in glory someday and fellowship with you. God bless you.